Good afternoon and welcome to all of you. Just delighted you're here. I'm Timothy Matavina. I'm a co-director of the Institute for Latino Studies and a professor of theology. It's my honor to moderate today. Uh, so I want to welcome all of you. We have our alumni board in this weekend. Uh, we have various advisory councils, including uh, I see a number of the Institute for Latino Studies advisory council members. Thank you for populating the audience. And everyone else, welcome. We're just delighted that you're here. Our topic today is not just to honor Father Ted Hesburgh, although you can't talk about him without honoring him. We're going to do what uh, I think is going to be happening for several generations now, trying to think in terms of historical context and contribution, what is the meaning of his life and his contribution to this great university. And we have an incredible panel today. Father Tom Blantz, on the far left, I think most of you know him, Professor Emeritus of History. He graduated from Notre Dame as a philosophy major in the seminary program in 1957. He earned his doctorate then from Columbia University and joined Notre Dame's faculty in the Department of History in 1968. He has served as the university archivist, as the vice president for student affairs, and as chair of the Department of History. He's lived in residence halls during most of his years of service here at Notre Dame and retired from teaching in 2014. He's authored two books and is currently researching a book on the history of Notre Dame and he'll be presenting some comments today that come out of that research. Uh, to his right is Dr. Nancy Hagel, Center Director for Material Science at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. She leads an organization of about 90 staff working in renewable energy and energy efficient technologies. Nancy received her BS degree in Metallurgical Engineering and Material Science from Notre Dame and a PhD in Material Science from the University of California, Berkeley. She was a postdoctoral scientist at Siemens Research in Erlingen, uh, Germany, before joining the faculty in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at UCLA. She has also been on the faculty at Fairfield University and the Naval Postgraduate School. Professor Hegel was 2012 Fulbright Scholar at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and she's been the recipient of multiple teaching awards and is currently a member of our Notre Dame Board of Trustees. Uh, she lives in Golden, Colorado with her husband, Bill, uh, here present with us, and also their two children. And finally, I know he doesn't need it, but I want to say some words about Father Edward Monk Malloy, who of course served as our 16th president from 1987 to 2005, and is ongoing as a professor in the Department of Theology, still actively teaching. His latest book, Monk's Tale, Way Stations on the Journey, is the second volume of his three-volume memoir, and the third volume is out in the spring, I believe, coming spring 2016. Father Malloy led Notre Dame at a time of rapid growth in its reputation, its faculty, and its resources. His service to higher education beyond Notre Dame is longstanding, encompassing leadership roles in many of the major higher education associations, including the American Council on Education, the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges, the International Federation of Catholic Universities, and various committees of the NCAA. Father Malloy has also played a leadership role in a number of social causes, including efforts to promote community service and combat substance abuse. In 2008, he donated a kidney to his nephew, and since then has become a strong advocate for organ transplantation. So let's welcome our speakers. We'll begin our learning today with Father Blantz. My charge was to say something about the presence before Father Hesburgh. There are 14 presidents before Father Hesburgh. I have 10 minutes, so. It's going to be like going through the Louvre on a motorcycle or something. <laughs> going to miss everything important. What I thought I would do is simply single out four presidents that I think uh, made major contributions to the university, of course, from the time that Father Soren founded in a log chapel, log cabin in 19, 1842 until Father Hesburgh in 1952. Four presidents, I think, were pivotal uh, presidents in Notre Dame's history and say a little bit about each one of them and their contribution. Father Soren himself, of course, has to be one of these. Founded the university in 1842, received a charter as a university in 1844, and was president then for 23 years until uh, 1865. Uh, 
There were four types of students at that time, as some of you know, the, the minims, the grade school children from boys from ages six to 12, and the uh, apprentices or the uh, manual labor school students about 13 to 21, learning a trade, uh, to be a, 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 a tailor, carpenter, farmer, whatever it was going to be, uh, the high school students, and then the college students. The college students under Father Sorn were always the uh, smallest of those four groups. That uh, It was a, a school for all kinds, all ages of, of students at that particular time with Father Soren and the, and the brothers um, the teaching at the, uh, at the university. It was a difficult 23 years uh, for Father Soren and, and the brothers that were here. Um, one, there was a period of anti-Catholicism at that time, that uh, when Father Soren built the first main building while it was going up, I, one of the neighbors told him to you know, continue building it because when you get finished, we're going to burn it down. Um, they didn't burn it down, of course, but uh, there was that feeling around anyway that he was always a little bit nervous. Uh, when he built one of the early buildings on campus, of course, he named it after a, not, not after a saint, but after the first president of the United States, George Washington, Washington Hall. The first uh, commencement uh, ceremony we had here in 1849 was uh, he uh, began the ceremony with the reading of the Declaration of Independence, trying to prove to the world that he was a, uh, an American and, and uh, uh, be loyal to the United States. Uh, in all ways. And a second major problem, of course, was finances, trying to run a university with, on, on a shoestring that they had at this particular time, buying and selling land when he needed it, um, uh, loaning, taking out loans very often, as a matter of fact. Um, the, um, sometimes when he was in serious difficulty with finances, he would undertake some rather large, noticeable expenditure, like putting a golden dome on a building or building a new barn or something like this, to make believe he had a lot of money to keep the creditors from the door. Um, <laughs> As one historian said, if he hadn't been a priest, he could have made a good living as a riverboat gambler. <laughs> but he was you know, very successful. At, uh, when Soren left the presidency in 1865, why, there was about 500 students on, on campus at that time, a faculty of, of 35, um, about 20 buildings on campus. Many of those were farm buildings, but there were 20 buildings on campus. And he had kind of a three-track uh, academic program. There was a liberal arts program at that time. And he already started the mercantile program, or kind of the beginning of the College of Commerce, I suppose, and the uh, science program. Um, and so when Soren left the presidency in 65, I think, uh, one, he had provided education for the young Catholic uh, boys uh, in this particular area at almost whatever level from the grade school through, uh, through college, and also had it on a pretty uh, firm foundation, that, except for a major tragedy why Notre Dame was, was on its way and uh, was certainly going to survive. The next presence I'd like to talk about is Father Thomas Walsh. Most people don't hear much about Walsh Hall, his name for him. President from 1881 until 1883, uh, 1893. Uh, he was Canadian, only 28 years old when he was made the president of the university. The problem with talking about Father Walsh, of course, is that Father Soren is still alive at this time. And Father Soren is the superior general. His Father Walsh is a superior. And so some of the achievements of this particular period in Notre Dame history uh, not quite sure whether they belong to Father Walsh or whether it's Father Soren uh, looking over his shoulder or more than that, uh, pushing him to do what he's, he's doing. Uh, during his uh, presidencies in the 1880s, there was a question of whether Notre Dame should be primarily a high school or primarily a college. We still had those four groups of students. Some of the faculty members and, and administrators felt it should be primarily a high school because one, you can train more people, teach more people at a high school, have larger classes, et cetera. And that was the goal, to try to train a good Christian gentleman for the world, et cetera. And it was going to be less expensive also. You'd have larger classes, and faculty wasn't going to be that expensive, et cetera. And so there were many that wanted to make this primarily a high school. Father John Zahm was the vice president at that time and leaned the other way, wanted to make it in the full uh, university. Admitting there was going to be smaller classes and more expensive teachers, et cetera, was going to be difficult, but uh, pushed it that way. I think Father uh, Walsh, as president, leaned more towards the Father Zahm, um, leaning towards this. And uh, during his presidency, uh, some of the buildings and things like this and, and transformations that take place. The major fire, of course, at Notre Dame, burning the, the second main building in, 17, in 1879. Uh, Father Soren and Father Corby, the president at that time, had rebuilt the, second, the central section of that. But it's under wall, so we put the two wings on the main building, complete that. But especially building La Fortune Student Center, which at that time was the science building, uh, that obviously to have a special building for science indicates that it was more, going to be more of a college than a high school. You went in, in the 1880s had a special science building for high schools at that time. He built the uh, 
present day the Crowley Hall of um, Music, which was the Institute for Technology at that time for the engineering college and so on, and especially Soren Hall, a, uh, the first uh, uh, residence hall with private rooms on a college, Catholic college campus in the United States that I think Walsh and Soren and Zom certainly felt that college students should not be living in dormitories and, and studying in study halls, et cetera, that they needed the privacy and the quiet, et cetera. So I believe that uh, Father Walsh really had the idea of making this, at least putting it on the verge to be a regular college similar to other colleges in the United States. And the last thing, of course, he does is uh, begin intercollegiate athletics at Notre Dame. And in 1887, we play Michigan uh, football for the first time, and we also have intercollegiate track and field. So I think uh, we still have those four groups of students on campus at that time. But on the other hand, I think under Father Thomas Walsh, we uh, have turned, uh, made, made a first step in, in any way to being a primarily a, a university, primarily a college at least. The third president I talk about is Father uh, James Burns. Burns is president from 1919 until 1922. Uh, uh, Burns had a doctorate in education, a um, disciple of Father Zahm, and uh, his expertise was in uh, Catholic education. He wrote three books on Catholic education in the United States, and his specialty was in uh, Catholic high schools. That he didn't believe that parishes should have high schools because the pastor was so busy with other things that the, the high school was not going to get his full attention. And most pastors probably were not really qualified to be uh, principals or, or to run a high school, etc., hiring faculty and setting the agenda and so on. And also Burns did not believe there should be high schools on college campuses because for the same reason they would not be getting the main attention of the college president and college administration. They would be getting the short um, straws at that time. And therefore, that he was advocating that uh, we should have uh, central Catholic high schools in various dioceses. Each diocese should have central Catholic high schools in their major cities, et cetera. So when he was made president, obviously, one of the first things that Father Burns did, of course, was to abolish the high school on, on campus, uh, feeling that, uh, the high, that bishops should have central, high, central Catholic high schools in, throughout their diocese. So he abolishes the high school in uh, 1919 and lets the sophomore juniors and seniors stay there so the last of the high school is 1922 when those first sophomores then do graduate. With that it leaves him more res residence hall space of course for increased enrollment in the, on the college level which does take place at that time. Um, that uh, means that he has to reorganize the university in, in many ways to try to keep up with the uh, expanded enrollment in faculty now on the college level. So he does organize the university into the five deanships who have appointing deans. Uh, three of the five were laymen at that particular time and department heads over each academic department and giving each one of those more authority in the hiring and the uh, uh, advising of students and uh, having faculty meetings, uh, college council meetings and uh, faculty meetings in each department instead of giving the layman on the university a little bit more influence into the uh, university. Uh, having it as primarily a university at this time is going to cost more money, and so he does uh, make arrangement with the Rockefeller Foundation, the General Education Board, for a million-dollar fund drive that if the university could collect $750,000, the um, Rockefeller Foundation would uh, donate the other $250,000. The Carnegie Foundation also added $50,000. So that he uh, does have then the first million-dollar fund drive in, the, in the Notre Dame's uh, history, and it is uh, successful. Um, in doing that, why he also sets up a uh, associate board of lay trustees of prominent business people and uh, bankers and others around the country, some Notre Dame alumni, half Notre Dame alumni, half not Notre Dame alumni, uh, to advise him on the uh, endowment and the uh, uh, where to put the money, et cetera. Not sure that priests with a vow of poverty were the best ones to handle that million dollars, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, setting up the um, associate board of, of, uh, of lay trustees to do that. Um, he is very successful then in reorganizing the university. And I might digress for a moment and say that the money angle also, you have to admit that a lot of the money was coming in at this particular time from football at Notre Dame and Newt Rockne. The Rockne has made foot, head football coach at Notre Dame in 1918. And in 1919, the university, at least the best records we have, seemed to indicate that uh, football brought in a profit of $250 in 1919. <laughs> Ten years later, in 1929, the profit is $540,000, over half a million dollars. So I, it seems that during the 1920s that football probably brought in under Newt Rockne somewhere between two and a half and maybe $3 million. And so the university does have money then at that particular time for the building expansion that takes place in the late 1920s and throughout the 1930s with the 
Howard and Morrissey and Lions Hall, the South Dining Hall, Dylan and alumni, and um, so and even uh, Breen Phillips, Zahm and, and, and Farley, uh, excuse me, um, Kavanaugh um, before the war. So that uh, Rockne certainly does have a place to play in, in Notre Dame history simply because of the money that he's bringing and making it possible for the other educational advances that take place. And a final president I'd like to say something about is the predecessor, Father Hesburg, and that is uh, John J. Kavanaugh. Um, John J. Kavanaugh, some of you know, uh, always kind of prided himself that uh, he'd never been to high school and yet he was president of Notre Dame. Um, John uh, Kavanaugh, born in Michigan, he was the oldest of uh, three children, and uh, his father died when he was quite young. When he uh, finished grade school, his mother sent him on to secretarial school to learn how to uh, shorthand and typing and stenography, et cetera, to go out and, and get a job, which he did. Uh, his younger brother became a seminarian at Notre Dame, and so he came down to visit his brother at one time and met the president of the university and told the president, if you ever need a secretary, I'm a good one. And the president said, I do need a secretary, and hired him. And so uh, John was his secretary, even though he had never been to high school. And he said after a couple of years, he realized that he was as bright as these other students there, even though he had never been to high school. <laughs> and so he asked the president, if I could pass the entrance exam, would you let me come? And he said, yes. And so he pa passed the entrance exams, and became a Notre Dame student, was actually student government president in his senior year, et cetera, and, and worked for Studebaker for a, a little bit after that, and then entered the seminary and uh, became president, nominated president, or elected president in 1946 to 52. Um, it's a, and I think he does make some very important changes at that particular time. There's a great influx of students at that time. Enrollment increases, of course, because of the GI Bill of Rights and other things. The university is getting bigger and bigger. He does reorganize the administration, setting up an executive vice president and various other vice presidents of business affairs, academic affairs, uh, student affairs, and public relations and alumni relations. Um, sets up the advisory council system, which we have uh, uh, today with the business advisory council, uh, Latino studies advisory council, and so on. Um, the advisory council to advise the dean and the president on the uh, progress of their individual uh, uh, colleges. He. Uh, Builds uh, several new buildings, uh, especially for science and for arts and letters. The Shaughnessy Hall built, uh, begun under John Cavanaugh, and also Newland Hall, et cetera. The Morris Inn also, and residence halls, Farley Hall and Fisher Hall, et cetera. So there is a, a period under John uh, Cavanaugh, I think, that their progress is, uh, is made. And also the, the Notre Dame Foundation, setting up a permanent fundraising arm of the university that we're not simply relying on individual subscriptions like this, but having it permanently so that the president can have some indication of how much money is coming in. And, and certainly, John Cavanaugh realized that education, good education is going to cost money, and therefore that we needed to make sure we have a good money coming in. And John set that up, and after his presidency, then ran the Notre Dame Foundation for several years as a fundraiser. Um, I suppose the major contribution, maybe someone would say, is, is picking in his, uh, for his last three years of office, picking Father Theodore Hesburgh as his uh, executive vice president, and then uh, choosing him as his successor also. And at the end of his six years, as in 1952, turning the university over to uh, Father, uh, Father Hesburgh. And with that, I'll, reaching Father Hesburgh, I'll turn it over to Father Malloy and Nancy Hagel, and they'll talk about Father Hesburgh. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Is that picking up okay? Good. Thank you, Tim. It's really a privilege for me to be here, a great joy. I'm joining two of my former Notre Dame professors. Uh, Father Blance taught me what I know about U.S. history since World War II and Monk, uh, Christian ethics today. Father Blance gave me an A minus, but we've moved beyond that. <laughs> uh, I was asked to reflect on the presidency of Father Hesburgh, a man who I think was a professor at Notre Dame in, in a, the full meaning of the word to profess. Um, as a scientist and a former faculty member myself, and now at uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab, I do a lot of panels on science, and I do panels on women, and I do panels on women in science. Um, but today I want to try a more ambitious trinity, science, women, and the Holy Spirit. And that might be an odd collection unless you wanted to talk about the presidency of Father Ted Hesburgh at Notre Dame. So first, uh, science. Starting maybe now about 2009, uh, various committees of the House of Representatives have proposed eliminating federal funding for the social sciences uh, at the National Science Foundation. This would be research in things like um, 
political science, economics, psychology, et cetera. The National Science Board is tasked with uh, overseeing the social sciences, and they have weighed in on this discussion. They've defended behavioral and economic sciences as having really important impact for the nation. Areas like poverty, healthcare, international sanctions, religious divisions, role of uh, nonprofits, all things that are important at Notre Dame. The National Science Board was founded in 1950, tasked to serve as the independent governing board for the National Science Foundation. And Father Hesburgh was an early member. He served from 1954 to 1966. And it was really one of the earliest high profile national service activities of his presidency. In an, a 50 year anniversary history of the board, Father Hesburgh is described as a quote, champion for the social sciences. And they tell the following story. In 1958, Reverend Theodore Hesburgh, an early influential member of the board, was named head of a committee tasked with defining the foundation's commitment to the social sciences. During one meeting from which Hesburgh was absent, his committee, quote, in a stormy session, watered down the draft report. Upon Hesburgh's return, he insisted that the board vote on the original language. Historian J. Merton England writes, perhaps this time the members, who were primarily physical scientists, were in a good mood. Perhaps they hesitated to challenge Hesburgh's obvious conviction, but in any event, they approved the original report, and NSF has founded, uh, funded social science to this day. I start with this old but somewhat timely story because for me it, it illustrates Father Ted's commitment to the broad human quest for knowledge. In his life, this, test, this quest was coupled to and perceived to be in no fundamental conflict with his quest to make God manifest in his life and in his work. Historically, we have a human tendency to try and limit uh, this quest for knowledge, sometimes through political battles, right, that influence federal funding decisions, sometimes in attempts to limit the free press, sometimes by declaring certain topics off limits for discussion or debate. Usually these attempts fail over time, but it's interesting to ask as people why, why it is we do this. What are we trying to accomplish when we don't want to ask or don't want to discuss? What are we afraid of? And so a central claim in my reflections is that Father Hesburgh's life and presidency often suggested, above all else, that we should not be motivated by fear whether in promoting science, social or otherwise, transforming Notre Dame into a co-educational institution, or taking the risk to listen uh, to the Holy Spirit in our lives or in our times. In 1977, which was the year that I arrived in Notre Dame, Father Hesburgh wrote a preface for a NASA study that for what ultimately became the SETI Institute, the uh, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And Father Ted wrote, there are very few questions that excite the curiosity, the imagination, and the exploratory bent of modern man more than the one posed in this study. Are we humans alone in this vast universe? The question is usually expressed in terms of other possible intelligent beings. The philosopher in me would want to believe that if there are other intelligent beings, they are also free and will use this freedom to try and find us. It's a fascinating question, right? How do intelligent beings gifted with life use their freedom? I think it was a question that Father Hesburgh posed to this university for 35 years as president, and then for many years after. I will never forget, even in his very last years, when he would arrive, somewhat unexpectedly, you could tell, at a meeting of the Board of Trustees. His presence always made us a better board because he focused us on the big questions. What will we do with our freedom, with our responsibility, with the trust that was placed in us for the university? At the end of the SETI forward, Father Hesburgh concluded, quote, as a theologian, I would say that this proposed search for extraterrestrial intelligence is also a search of knowing and understanding God through his works, especially those works that most reflect him. Finding others than ourselves would mean knowing him better. Finding others than ourselves would mean knowing him better. 
I suggest that the same basic intuition that led Father Ted to support social science work at the National Science Foundation and the search for extraterrestrial life also led him to be open to the need for co-education at Notre Dame. So topic two, Notre Dame, women at Notre Dame. We've all heard the anecdotes from the early days. You know, An apology was offered to the Blessed Mother for taking so long. Women would finally civilize the place. <laughs> And while we were exerting our civilizing influence, we would simultaneously raise academic standards. Right? <laughs> we were multitaskers in an early day. It really is important, I think, to remember that no Notre Dame was neither a leader uh, nor remotely alone in making such a move. At least 38 colleges and universities began either to admit women completely or to expand the ways they did between 1969 and 1973. This included Princeton, Johns Hopkins, Williams, Brown, Harvard, and many uh, of the Jesuit institutions. But underneath it all for Father Ted, I always believed, was a belief that Notre Dame's growth at that time required, uh, to use his SETI language, that she, quote, find others than ourselves. And having found them in that pioneering class of 72 and then all that followed, she was committed to welcome them and engage them and even anticipate some conflict with them. Right? But it would be worth it because Notre Dame could grow. It could be better than it was. The same will likely be true, I think, if we encounter other intelligent life in the universe. They are unlikely to be like us. They will be other than ourselves. It probably won't be a totally comfortable encounter. But a belief, I think, in a fallen uh, but good universe gives us hope that it's going to be valuable. There might be something new we could learn. So finally, the Holy Spirit. We know that Father Ted's favorite prayer was, come Holy Spirit. One of my favorite verses from the Hebrew scriptures is Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I am doing something new. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? For me, Father Hesburgh's presidency was marked by an openness to the something new, a willingness to perceive it, to take the risk. This was not done uncritically, not without reflection or discipline. He never struck me as someone who chased new just for new, but he also did not uncritically worship the past, and he was willing to accept the challenges that would come from disturbing what might be a well-entrenched status quo. Many of us remember as well the arguments against the admission of undergraduate women. That Notre Dame was here to educate leaders, and that meant men, right? And therefore, we would lose influence and impact if we admitted women. That the presence of women would destroy the, quote, special nature of the place. It would go soft. And that the fact that everybody else was doing it was not a good reason for Notre Dame to do the same. Right? Today, that critique would be, don't ape your peers. Okay? But Father Ted insisted right, that we, Notre Dame, see beyond those fears and perceive the something new. And everybody has to be their own judge of that uh, 43 years later. The Gettysburg Address contains the famous line, it is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have so far so nobly advanced. The unfinished work that Lincoln identified included a new birth of freedom for the nation. And Father Hesburgh's contribution to the unfinished work of civil rights over 100 years following that address was an example of the dedication still required from the living. We have found a number of Earth-like planets by now uh, NASA announced just in July of this year the observation of Kepler-452. It has an orbit of 385 days at a quite reasonable distance around a, a star that is very much like our own. And last year, one of Notre Dame's very engaging What Would You Fight For videos featured physics professor Justin Krepp, whose research focuses on identifying planets that can support life. And I bet Father Ted was pleased to watch it. But we are still looking for signs of intelligent life. At least for now, federal funding will continue for the social sciences at Notre Dame and everywhere else. And we have watched Notre Dame grow and struggle and mature as a world-renowned, fully co-educational Catholic university. 
but we continue to discover broader ways that women and many others will be called to contribute. And maybe one day, Notre Dame will welcome students from another planet. <laughs> one great legacy, I think, of, Father Hes of Notre Dame's 15th president is reminding us that there is unfinished business for this university, unfinished business for all of us. The Holy Spirit continues her work, and we have work to do as well. May Father Ted pray for us in our labor, and may he rest in peace. Thank you. I can see a Martian playing quarterback. <laughs> I'd like to point out to Father Tom Blance that I gave Nancy an A. <laughs> And she ended up giving arguably the best valedictor valedictorian address in the history of the university, so I'll take credit for that. I miss Ted. One of the ways I'm reminded of that is when I sign at one of Notre Dame's eating establishments, the bill, I put, I used to put President Emeritus too. Now I just put President Emeritus. It's just a reminder to me about how integral he was to our life and to my life. There are certain iconic pictures of Ted. One that I think of appears frequently in his prime, wearing one of those ecclesiastical beanies <clears throat> time of uh, commencement, handsome as could be, full of energy and enthusiasm, interacting with students. Another powerful one for me, although it was only viewed by myself, was when he was celebrating Mass with myself and an Arab Christian driver right on the Sea of Galilee in a motel room right near where Jesus' ministry took place, where I could imagine any of us listening to Jesus' proclamations and thinking about how much he and his own ministry was simply Jesus for others in another time in history. We all know the picture of Ted linking arms with Martin Luther King Jr. in Chicago. A copy of that's in the Student Center. Uh, that was, of course, in retrospect, a pivotal moment in the Civil Rights Movement, and he was there. <laughs> One of the most moving things for me, separate from his own funeral celebration, was when he received the Congressional Gold Medal. And he and I, the President of the United States, and the heads of the both parties in the House and Senate, all had a chance to speak in the rotunda, a place that I had been to many times, had given tours of, and never in my wild imagination, and I'm sure Ted would say the same thing, did we think that we would be there. And there was so much enthusiasm by these power brokers who were with him, as if they were in awe of his company. I'd like to say something first about family. Ted came to Holy Cross at a relatively young age. And in those days, uh, it was fairly rigorous rules about how, how often you could go home. And so he switched from being present to his genetic family to being more present to his religious family. But he had, his father died younger, when he was younger, but his mother was alive. And the first bit of advice he gave me when I became president was take care of your mother which I think really was derived from his own sense of loss uh, with that prime influence in his own development. He was so proud of his nieces and nephews when they came to the university. He loved having in his later years his brother Jim and his wife Mary and some of their children who would often come and visit him when he was at Holy Cross House. 
his early ministry in Vetville, where he was, in a sense, in a prime situation. People, right after the war, they were marrying, they were having a lot of children. He was involved in marriages and baptisms and all those things that go with being surrounded by young married people. He often told me that was one of the favorite times in his whole life. He felt like his ministry was bearing good fruit there, and it surely was. Later in life, uh, he was able to adopt uh, a family, members of a family. Uh, and he, he used to describe how he took care of all the multiple children, and he felt like a father himself. Family was always important to him. When it came to Holy Cross, he was always ready to give a talk on behalf of a, a grade school, a high school, a parish, a college, a hospital, a mission uh, engagement, or whatever it might be. He felt that as a Holy Cross religious, he had a primary obligation to be of assistance in any way that he could. So his sense of family was strong. A thought about his health. He, I asked him one time when he was in his 90s, you've outlived all of your peers, how did you do it? I said, I've never seen you exercise. <laughs> you seem to enjoy good food and good drink. You smoke cigars, how did you do it? He said, good genes. <laughs> Ted enjoyed good health, not just in the normal routine of life, but also as somebody who was an inveterate traveler. He was often in very dangerous places, not simply in terms of human interaction, but in terms of what you could eat and drink. And yet that never deterred him. He had this little black bag he carried everywhere with him, which included all the implements for mass, including vestments, and he had pills to solve every kind of thing that could happen to him on the road. <laughs> I think if the DEA existed in those days, he would have been arrested <laughs> many times over. Uh, late in life, later in life, when he was president, he once fell in a shower in a hotel, and he lay there for a whole period of time. And there was some arthritis that later developed relative to that. And if you ever noticed, he wore a copper brace, bracelet on his wrist because he was absolutely convinced that that prevented the, the pain from that injury and from arthritis from inhibiting him. And late in life, he also lost a kidney. Uh, I went over and visited him, and uh, I had given a kidney, so the, those two presidents of Notre Dame were with one kidney, and I think Father Jenkins is destined to end up with <laughs> one kidney as well. The last thing to say something about relative to health is his blindness. I never once heard him complain about macular degeneration and losing his sight. His, his line instead was, God gave me these two eyes. I put them to good use for all of these years. How can I complain? That's the way he dealt with challenges of whatever kind. He was a polyglot and a polymath. A polyglot in the sense that because he spent time in Europe in the early stages of his uh, seminary formation, he learned multiple languages and he became interested in languages and he was able to fake languages if he had to. <laughs> he was really good in Asia in faking languages. <laughs> but people are always impressed when you, you go out of your way to learn their language. And he knew that that was one of the means of, of getting involved. He loved celebrating mass on his trips to Latin America. Uh, he had these two business friends of his that he would travel to Mexico with, and he would celebrate Mass for the people in the villages, some of whom had not had access to the priest since the last time he was there. So he was somebody that uh, relished learning other people's languages and cultures. He was a polymath in a sense that he was not a master of anything, but he was interested in everything. So all these things that popes and presidents asked him to do, he did not have a natural background in. I'm somebody who grew up in Washington, D.C., was part of the Civil Rights Movement, went to a heavily integrated school, was a basketball player where integration was a big thing. Uh, he didn't have any of that, and yet he played such a forthright and important leadership role with the Civil Rights Commission. He learned by reading, by talking, by interacting, 
and by overseeing the utilization of experts to help people of similar uh, backgrounds to figure out what kind of policies to recommend. The same thing was true in science. He had no particular scientific training. He didn't know that much about immigration and the way to deal with that or about people who had refused to serve in the Vietnam War and how to regularize their reentry into society. He didn't know that much about athletics. He gave much of that to Ned Joyce during his presidency, and yet he served in a pivotal role with uh, the Knight Commission on behalf of the NCAA. Last thing I'd like to say is that he was mission-oriented. He was a man of prayer. He was rather uh, conservative in terms of his piety. Celebrate mass every day, the office, the rosary, visits to the grotto, uh, taking time for prayer. And yet at heart, he was an activist, a doer. He was somebody that wanted to plunge in and make a difference. He never saw any disconnect between that inner side of his life and the outer side. And I think what people saw in him was a man who strove to be holy, who wanted to be an agent of the gospel to make a difference in his own time. Whatever he was asked to do, he took it on with fervor and enthusiasm. And so we collectively, as we discovered, I think, during his uh, celebration of his life and death during his funeral liturgy, we saw a man who is probably, in most people's judgment, uh, one of the great leaders of the 20th century, one of the great higher education leaders in history, and somebody that we have a right to be proud of. May we follow his example. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Friends, we're going to have a little short time for questions now. I'd like to remind you of the advice of St. Thomas Aquinas to preachers. Veritas, claritas, brevitas. <laughs> I'll take a first person in the back, please. Please just stand up and speak loudly. Father Boy, can you comment on the, um, the starts and stops of co-education that Father Ted was going through when he was trying to implement it, and at first with St. Mary's and then independently, and how that went in his own mind. I was just at a St. Mary's board meeting yesterday and the day before and the day before that, so uh, we carry on that relationship, uh, which I think is a very good one between the two institutions. I think what happened, uh, Ted knew that we needed to move in the direction of co-education. The most obvious way of doing that and achieving that goal was a merger between Notre Dame and St. Mary's. The Sisters of the Holy Cross, on the other hand, uh, at first were very attracted to it. It would solve many problems that they had. It would provide a different resource base. Uh, but then as it got closer to a realization, uh, I think they, they thought that there were some very important dimensions that would be lost as a, as a uh, single-sex institution with a long and distinguished heritage, they decided in the end not to go forward. So that put Ted and the Notre Dame administration on the line uh, to come up with a different alternative, and that, of course, was the implementation of co-education, as Nancy described it in 72. There were rough moments. Uh, the first class that came here put up with stuff that they'd be sued for now, uh, but that was part of the transition in the institution. I think the biggest challenge for us going co-educational was in the, the, not just with, with the faculty, but was the, the administration and with, with the students, the administration and the faculty. It took us a long time, including through my administration, to make headroom in, in, in terms of being more fully co-educational. Ted knew that all along, but you have to start somewhere. And the most obvious place was with the students. Today, I think the relationship is a good and healthy one. Both institutions are thriving. Could you comment on the relationship uh, with Father Hesper and Father Joyce uh, during their particular time? I remember that it was a, when I attended, it was a very, very close relationship and a very unique one. Tommy, we'll do that first. 
It certainly was a, a very close and unique relationship. I think they, uh, it's a good question because I've thought about it myself for other reasons. And uh, there's no question Father Hesburgh was the president. He was making the final decisions and Father Joyce would bring decisions to him if there was a question. He wasn't looking over all the vice presidents and Father Executive Vice President why he would often bring it to Father Hesburgh. But on the other hand, it almost at times looked like we're almost co-presidents, that there were some areas of Father Hesburgh was uh, in academic affairs and student affairs was uh, directly involved in more uh, with the, those vice presidents and in other areas like in athletics and building and finances why uh, Father Joyce was pretty much um, making the final decisions uh, for that. And so it sometimes it did look like there was almost co-presidents, each one running their own uh, areas of the university where they had the expertise and the real passion for it. And yet on the other hand, there was no question Father Hesper was the final voice if the questions ever came up. But uh, so uh, it was a unique relationship and I think they uh, just harmonized with each other so well as Father Hesper mentioned. You know, he's a northern and Ned was a southerner and he's a little more liberal and Ned a, was a more conservative and so on. And so they did uh, mesh very well. I think the university profited very much simply because of the differences between the two. Can I say anything on that? They were an odd pair. <laughs> you may have heard my reflection where I said if the uh, travels with Ted and Ned had been travels with Ned and Ted, you might have had a different uh, description of what went on in their trip. Uh, Ted often said to me that his best friend uh, in the community, at least, was Ned Joyce. He also said that he had never had a fight, which I attribute to the fact that Ted had the power in the end for the making of the final decision. But um, I think they, like a married couple, they learned how to defer to each other in appropriate ways. Yes, dear, or something like that. <laughs> But their legacy is a great one. Uh, they, it was a, it was team a teamwork, and uh, uh, I know when Ned died, uh, Ted profoundly felt the sense of loss. I think you should hear your comments on Father Hesper's relationship with the Bishop of Fort Wayne, South Bend, and with the Holy See. Well, one of Ted's uh, great friends was Pope. Paul VI, and he was the one who asked them to start the uh, Tantor Ecumenical Institute in Jerusalem. Uh, he often visited him on, on visits to Rome. Uh, Ted was the founder of uh, IFCU, founding president, International Federation of Catholic Universities, and I was on that board for almost all my presidency. Uh, I think Ted uh, was very desirous of having a good relationship with the, whoever the Pope was and the various Vatican offices. Uh, on the other hand, he was very critical of what he took on occasion to be officiousness and excessive claims of authority that didn't uh, belong, especially in a higher education environment. Um, he uh, had a very good relationship with the local bishops, as did I. And we both worked at it. And one of the ways that that was manifest is when we disagreed, we talked privately instead of publicly. And, uh, and if, if the local bishop disagreed with us, we encouraged them to speak out. That's your responsibility if it's something that's within your area of competence. I think what that allowed Notre Dame to do is to find its appropriate role as a fully Catholic institution. Uh, but also a place where academic freedom was fully appreciated and, and uh, observed. Uh, there, were mo there were always moments in any of those kind of dynamics that are a little less pleasant, but most of the time I think it went extremely well. And we had a tradition at commencement that the local bishop would come uh, to, to commencement, say, uh, would say something, would, would uh, be there for the baccalaureate mass, and would often come to campus to celebrate mass or for other things. So I think it worked really well. Father Hesper started as president of the organization. What extent did he have done in terms of importance in the impact 
impact the football team, the football program, and the race, what you thought, I think, early on was the football factor in it. Father Hesburgh's, I think, uh, major goal when he took over the presidency in 1952 was to make Notre Dame a great academic institution, that he felt that there really wasn't a Catholic institution, a Catholic uh, university in the United States was on the same level as the major university, the Ivy League, et cetera. I think he felt that other universities could have done that. The Jesuits, for example, with the 28 colleges, that they had put all their best men in one place, maybe they could, but they weren't doing that. And so that I think Father Hesburgh felt that that's what he wanted to do, was to raise the academic level of, of the university. Uh, and he did raise the uh, uh, requirements, academic requirements and things like this. Um, as a result of that, uh, there was a, I think Frank Clay, he, uh, Frank Clay, he was the coach when he took over, of course, and Frank was uh, having some health problems, et cetera, and, and, and left the year after that, and, and, and they hired uh, Terry Brennan as, uh, as the coach. Uh, that uh, didn't turn out very well, and so the uh, football seasons were getting worse and worse, and, and Pip were making a connection between that, whether you're raising the academic standards too high and you can't bring in better players, et cetera, and Father Hesburgh insisted that he never intended to, uh, never wanted to de-emphasize football at all. If you're going to be into anything, you want to be the very best you could in excellence in, in every area, et cetera. But he certainly took a lot of criticism for that. They did at that time change the uh, grading system a little bit from a percentage, 100% 100 grading system to a six-point system, et cetera. And athletes had to have, varsity athletes had to have a two uh, point system to be, and that came out to be about an 80 actually, and before that had been 77. So one could argue that the, that the um, level did raise a little bit, but I don't think it, uh, but no, that was not his intention, but he certainly took criticism for that. But his main goal was to raise the academic standards and, uh, of that, and, and, uh, uh, and some people thought in doing that why it was de-emphasizing football, but I don't think he ever intended to de-emphasize football, except to make sure it stayed within the bounds of the universe. And I think at times he felt that maybe, frankly, he had uh, overstepped those a little bit with uh, some of the uh, decisions that he had made. As a former resident of Farley Hall, I had a sacrifice in my senior year uh, for co-education, but I too have moved beyond that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to ask a question in a different area. Yeah. Patrick, uh, often described Notre Dame as the place where the Catholic Church does its thing. Now that we're uh, 50, 50 years or 40 years beyond that particular statement, where do you think Notre Dame fits in terms of the Catholic Church doing its thing? What has it added to the scholarship? Well, I certainly don't have the perspective of my colleagues up here, but I do find, I mean, I've spent most of my life away from Notre Dame, unlike, and, you know, as I travel, as I work around the world and read, I mean, I, I, I do think a lot of the scholarship that, that you see having impact comes from here. A lot of the leaders that we know go out into education come from, have been influenced by Notre Dame. I also worked for the Jesuits for 10 years, of which I am very proud. And so, um, you know, it, it does take a village. Notre Dame plays a, a hugely important role in that village, but it, it is a big village and an international one. And I think that's a wonderful thing. My experience suggested, having given many talks along the way, that because the majority of Notre Dame alumni are graduates of the undergraduate program or the parents had children go to the undergraduate, the hardest case to make is the importance of professional and graduate, edu particularly graduate education. We could not be the kind of university we become if we had not devoted so much time, attention, and resources to our graduate program. The result of that is more, a much higher percentage of our undergraduate students work with faculty on research projects, get published, do things uh, over the summer that are academically related, and it makes a huge difference in what they can be eligible to do after they graduate. Uh, that would not be possible unless we were attracting faculty that were capable of doing those kinds of things in every area of life. Uh, I think this pot potential that we have uh, to produce leaders in just about any field that you can imagine, at least that's offered here, uh, is without end. And uh, we have to have confidence 
that that's an important dimension of what we're about. Um, I, I don't want to get in. I, I'm a big supporter of the of all the construction going on because I think it serves a very important purpose. But it's one of the ways of thinking. The physical reminds you of all the faculty, all the students, all the programs that will be taking place within these additional spaces. And the, the way in which our institutes and centers and so on are allowing us to focus on some of the great issues of the day, I just think is, is a tremendous uh, testimony to what John Cavanaugh and Ted and, and all of us have tried to do ever since to make Notre Dame a first-class university in every possible way. Three trustees up here. <laughs> we didn't want to talk about ourselves, not you. <laughs> uh, I'll start. I'll just say something briefly. Obviously, Ted. The two great things that the two things that Ted was most proud of as president was coeducation and the lay board of trustees. I think what that's allowed us to do is to be able to attract an amazing combination of qualities and people and resources that never would have been available otherwise, and to do it with great enthusiasm and panache. Uh, so you being one of them, uh, I, on behalf of the trustee, other trustees, thank you. <laughs> I would very much agree. So I came on the trustees as a young alumni trustee. I believe the year Monk uh, took over as president. And so for all my experience as a trustee, Father Ted was always in the back with people like you making side comments sometimes. <laughs> uh, but, but clearly you could tell uh, as the years went on his great pride in the, the quality of people and the dedication in, across all areas, whether it was higher education or the social science areas or finance, the, the ability to bring um, such talented and devoted people together to help with the university was a great joy, I think, to him, and a, a great testament to where we are today. Mike. Well, friends, if I could be permitted a final word. Uh, our speakers will stay after if you have any other questions, but we're going to finish on time for the sake of those having other things to go to. Uh, we've all got our anecdotes. One of my favorites of really within the two months before he died, Father Hesburgh met with some students of ours uh, connected to the work we do at the Institute for Latino Studies. Uh, the first group, they were freshmen of DACA students that were admitted under Father Jenkins' policy. He was later quoted, Father uh, Hesburgh was quoted posthumously in the uh, Washington Post having encouraged these students tremendously by telling them that they should help to make Notre Dame great in the same way that w women did when they first came and made it co-educational. And th that remains with those students as a great encouragement to them. This goes back to what Dr. Hagel was saying. Uh, Father Hesburgh was always about the future to the very last moment. He was always about, this is a great place, let's make it better. So in that spirit, uh, c continuing the work of Father Hesburgh, recognizing that we, our job is to make this great university even better. I thank all of you for being here today, for your attention, for your love of Notre Dame, and for Father Hesburgh. And I thank our speakers for a phenomenal job. Go Irish. Thank you.